All right. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Are there any questions? Anybody have any questions about um, any of the material? Okay. Escape. And all right. So it sounds like there's no questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So today. <coughs> Is Thursday. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm going to say it's March 18. Yeah. Okay, so we've covered chapter three. The next subject area is chapter four. And chapter four is reactions in aqueous solution, which essentially means in water, in solutions that have water, which is called a solvent. Okay, so we're going to talk today about the general aspects of um, water and solutions and mixtures. And then as we move along, we'll start looking at some specific types of reactions. Many reactions occur in water. Not all reactions occur in water. So like if you light a match, that's not occurring in water. Um, but all of the reactions occurring in your body, almost all of them are occurring in water. So there's a lot of chemistry that goes on in water. So let's talk a little bit about the properties of water. And then we'll get into how water interacts with other materials. So water has the chemical formula H2O. Of course, it's a liquid at room temperature. So when we analyze chemical reactions in this chapter, we're going to be looking at reactions that are occurring essentially at room temperature. So we can be sure that water is a liquid under those circumstances. Okay. The arrangement of atoms of water is interesting. The oxygen is at the center and it acts as a bridge between two hydrogen atoms. Okay, so it's sort of a V-shaped. It's called a bent arrangement. And if you were to measure the angle between the hydrogen atoms, so you start off here and just draw a line that goes across to the other hydrogen, um, you would find that that angle is 104.5 degrees. So a little more than a right angle, right? Or a little more than 90 degrees, but less than 180, which would be a straight line, okay? Now, one aspect of water that's interesting is that oxygen has what's called a high electronegativity, essentially meaning that any electrons um, that are shared between the hydrogen atoms and the oxygen are shared more tightly by the oxygen atom than they are by the hydrogen atoms. So the result of that is that the oxygen atom develops a negative, a small negative charge. So I'll put a little negative here because it essentially has excess electrons from the hydrogen atoms. So these, these two electrons here, there's two electrons here. We'll go through that when we get to chapter eight. And there's two electrons there. Those electrons are shared or held more tightly by the oxygen atom. The result of that is that you develop a positive charge between the hydrogen atoms. So the molecule, even though it's V-shaped, in a sense behaves like a little tube with a negative end and a positive end. And the positive is in between the two hydrogen atoms, like right smack dab in the middle, okay? And this is called a dipole. It's called an electric dipole. Okay, so that's not the shape of the molecule, right? The shape of the molecules is V-shaped, but the electrical properties can be modeled as a dipole. It's just like a little tube with a negative end and a positive end. 
Now, this has some interesting results or some interesting ramifications. Essentially, what it allows water to do is to interact with itself. So if you have water molecules that are near each other, so I'll draw just a couple. And again, you have this positive end here and a negative end there. Effectively, what happens is the water molecules, because they're liquid, they're able to move around and rotate and translate, which means move in some direction. They will um, essentially orient themselves so that the oxygen atoms are close to the center between those two hydrogen atoms right in the middle there. So that they can interact via this electricity, right? Electrostatics, they call it. This is an attractive force, right? Because positive and negative charges attract each other. And then positive and positive repel negative and negative repel. Okay. So you'll see that um, in water molecules, there's an attraction between them and that leads to what we call cohesion or cohesive forces. Sometimes it's called cohesive forces. And what we'll do in chapter eight is we'll look a little more detail about how to how to talk about this electronegativity that's giving rise to these charges. But just keep in mind that the water molecule behaves as if it had two ends, a positive end and a negative end, and that's called an electric dipole. So I'm gonna try, just, be, just for practical reasons, I'm gonna use this sort of picture of the water molecule instead of the other one, because it's just easier to draw, right? So, Drawing you know, these structures can get kind of complicated. So I'm just going to use that electric dipole as our sort of model. So here's what happens. If you take an ionic compound, and there are different types of ionic compounds. So the definition of an ionic compound is one, it's, an, it's a compound, so it has two or more elements, right? That's what makes something a compound. Now they have to be in some fixed ratio, meaning that if it's a particular compound, you can't have some of it having one sodium and one chlorine and then others having one sodium and two chlorines. The ratio one to one is what defines sodium chloride, one sodium for every chlorine. So it's a fixed ratio, one to one. Um, so you have to have two elements. That's what makes something a compound. Ionic means it's composed of ions. Okay, so it's made out of ions. And there's two types of ions. There are ions that are positively charged, and those are called cations. And the cations are typically metals. Okay, so when we talk about the metals, the metals are the alkali metals, the first column in the periodic table. Okay, so not including hydrogen, although hydrogen sometimes forms a cation as well. So the first column, those alkali metals, those tend to form cations. The second column, Ca, oh, I'm forget, N-A-K-R-B-C, yeah. Um, oh, I see, I, I just wrote this up a little too high. So the beryllium is up here. There we go. Didn't look right to me. And barium. There we go. Okay. So these also tend to form ions. And then the other metals that you've probably heard of. So for example, I'm going to, um, you got the transition metals here. This is the periodic table. 
right? These are called the transition metals. These also tend to form positively charged ions. So just to show you an example, Fe, for example, is in there. It tends to form ion, uh, cations. And then coming over here, this is where you get to aluminum. That's a metal. That one also tends to form cations, okay? Now there's actually a very simple rule that you can use to predict what the charges of these cations are. And that is just to look at their position in terms of their column. So we often refer to this first column as column 1A and the second column 2A. I'm gonna ignore the transition metals for now. And then when you get to aluminum, this is often referred to as 3A. Okay, so you're just counting from left to right. Many periodic tables will have those uh, labels. They'll have these labels indicated on them, okay? So the general rule is that if a metal is in the first column, it has a charge of plus one. So in a compound, if it's in one of these ionic compounds, it'll have a charge of plus one. If it's in the second column, column 2A, and it's in an ionic compound, it'd have a charge of plus two. Okay, that's kind of cool. So, so you don't have to worry about barium being plus three or minus two. Barium's gonna be plus two all the time. And sodium, which is right here, is gonna be plus one. That's cool too. And then aluminum, aluminum's the only one that I'm writing in there because it's really the only metal in that row that's all the way over on the right side of the table, but it happens to be there. Aluminum is plus three. And then these metals have all kinds of different charges. They're all positive, but they could be plus one or plus two, plus three. There's not really much order to that. So you just have to know them just based on experience and looking at formulas and stuff like that. You figure it out from the context. But these, this first two columns here, they're very predictable. So if it's lithium, it's plus one. If it's beryllium, it's plus two, so forth and so on. So those are, those are cations. There is also one other cation that is not a metal, and it's an interesting cation. It's very common. It's an important cation, so I'm going to put it right here. It's called ammonium. And it's actually not a metal. It's actually a, what's called a polyatomic ion. It has four, uh, five atoms, and it has a charge of plus one. So when we write plus, that means it's plus one, okay? So it's also a cation. It's an unusual cation. It's, a, it's unusual in the sense that it's not a metal, but there are cations that are not metals. There's a bunch of them out there, actually. If you buy um, detergents, detergents often have these non-metallic cations in them. If you read the ingredients of a detergent, you'll see them in there. They're, they tend to be called like tetraquadral ammonium salts and stuff like that. So um, there are a bunch of them out there, but you don't need to know those at this stage. For this course, if you just know the metals and you know the ammonium ion, you should be in pretty good shape there. That's, that's just the ones. Now, the second type of ion is called an anion. So I'm gonna write that over here. Okay, so anion, so cation, anion. And just as the cations tend to be the metals, the anions tend to be the non-metals, which are shown off on the right side of the periodic table. So, you know, these first two columns are, are metals, the transition are the metals, and then on the right side, that's where you have your non-metals over there. So typically these are non-metals. Okay, and let's take a look at some of them. So uh, uh, I'm gonna start over here. I'm gonna write the um, symbols and I just, I'm just trying to make sure I get these in the right columns. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and then neon. Now I'm gonna draw a little line here to indicate that in general, helium's up here, by the way, that we don't have to worry about these. 
Those are called the noble gases and they do not tend to form ions. So we can ignore them for this discussion. Um, but here we have carbon and below carbon is silicon. This is nitrogen, below that is phosphorus, below that is arsenic. So notice I'm not drawing all of them out because you don't need to know all of them. You just need to know a few of them. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Okay, so when we do this numbering system for the columns, this one right here, and again, notice I didn't write all the elements. I only want the ones that are really important for us. This is column 4A. And the one with nitrogen and phosphorus and arsenic, this is 5A. And the one with oxygen, sulfur, and selenium, this is 6A. And the one with fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, this is 7A. Now this one here is called 8A, but like I said, you don't need to know about the noble gases for this discussion. We're not concerned about that, okay? So here's the pattern. We're looking for patterns in the periodic table, and there are some. There aren't as many as we would like for there to be, but there are some. And so the first pattern we just looked at with the first two columns, plus one, plus two, there's a similar pattern working in the opposite direction for the nonmetals. And that starts with what are called the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, 7A, this one right here. In ionic compounds, these atoms tend to form negatively charged ions, anions, and they tend to be charged minus one. So just like on the far left, it's plus one. On the far right, it's minus one. Not the noble gases, but with the halogens. These are called halogens, by the way. The halogens are group 7A. Moving to the left, the next column, which includes oxygen, sulfur, and selenium, these are minus two. Pretty predictable. So if you see an ionic compound and it has sulfur in it, the sulfur is most likely charged negative two. And the next one over, 5A, is nitrogen, phosphorus, and arsenic. And I'm going to stop right there, minus three. So 5A is minus three. So just so you see, I'll draw a little dashed line just so you can see where these line up. Okay. So there's really five columns where this pattern holds. The first two over here for the cations and these three over here for the anions. Sometimes people will put carbon and silicon as minus four. Relatively rare that that's observed though. So I'm not even gonna include that. So first two columns and then aluminum is plus three. And then these columns over here are minus three, minus two, minus one, right? Those are the, the ones that we can use. And it turns out there's a lot of common compounds that include those ions. So for example, salt, table salt, right? The salt that's in the oceans. That's a combination of this ion right here, sodium ion with this ion over here, the chloride ion, right? So that, that's just one example. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, let's see. Calcium plus two with chloride minus one, right? So these are, are, we'll see them a lot in these types of problems, okay? So those are our first two types of ions, the cation and the anion. And these are all called monatomic ions. That's another term. And we represent them. What you do is you write the symbol for the element. And then you write the charge as a superscript. The one thing you have to be careful with is that if it's plus one, you just write plus. You don't write plus one explicitly. If it's plus two, you write plus two. So what you do is you say, hey, what's a sodium ion? A sodium ion is in the first column. So you write the symbol. And then you write the plus, OK? Suppose I said, hey, we have a strontium ion. Strontium's right here. So a strontium ion, you would write SR. And then you say, oh, it's in the second column, 2A, so it's plus two. So you write plus two. Now, sometimes chemists will write the two before the plus. I, I don't really care whether you write plus two or two plus. The convention is to write the number and then the sign. That's perfectly fine. but. 
it means the same thing. When we say SR2 plus, what we mean is plus two. That's its charge. So those are a couple of cations. Aluminum, for example, we'd say, oh, aluminum is that one element over on the right side that's plus three. So we would write AL, you write the symbol, and then plus three. And that would be an aluminum ion. You can do the same thing for the anions. So for example, if we said nitrogen, the nitrogen is symbol N, and it's in this column right here, so minus three. Now, one thing to mention about the anions, when we name them, we change the endings to IDE. So this is not called the nitrogen ion, it's called nitride ion. You don't have to do that with the cations, but with the anions, we change the names, the endings. So for example, oxygen, it's in this column here, so it's minus two. That would be called an oxide ion. So the, the metals, you don't change the ending, sodium, strontium, aluminum ions. But for the non-metals, you have to change the ending to IDE. So nitride, oxide, fluoride, if you're talking about this one over here, okay? So those are the monatomic ions. Monatomic just means one atom, right? So if you look at the chemical formula for this ion, there's just one in there, there's just one atom. There's just one sodium. It's not Na2 or Na3 or NaO, you know, it's just Na, so it's one atom. Same thing with, this, with the oxygen, the oxide ion. There's one oxygen in there, so it's a monatomic ion. These ions combine with each other in nature to form ionic compounds. So these monatomic ions, I'll just write ions, combine to form compounds. Ionic compounds, right? If they're made up of ions, they're ionic compounds. So for example, a sodium ion, right? That's a sodium ion. It might combine, oops, sorry. I'm gonna have a little technical issue here. Just take a minute here. I just have to, I'll just, I'll, I'll stop it right there and ask, are there any questions so far about these ions? I don't know if you've had this material before. Give myself a little break. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, they combine, so the cation combines with the anion. So I'll do a simple one here. Okay, so this is a sodium ion. Combines with a chloride ion. And then here's what you do. The driving force behind the formation of an ionic compound is electrical neutrality, meaning that the positive charge will counteract the negative charge and they'll cancel each other, if you want to use that terminology. The positive charge has to equal the negative charge. So if they have the same number of charges, so for example, sodium ion has a charge of plus one and the chloride ion has a charge of minus one, they will combine in a one-to-one -one ratio. So you'll just get NaCl. And when we write the compound, we do not, we do not write the charges in it. They're not shown, they're implicit, meaning that we look at that and we say, oh, they are ions, but we don't show them in the formula. So you do show, you do show the charges for the specific ions, but when they combine to form a compound, you don't show the charges. So another example would be the magnesium ion. It has a charge of plus two. And the oxide ion has a charge of minus two. Remember, this is in column 2A, so it's plus two. This is in column 6A, so it's minus two. If the charges are of equal size or magnitude, right? Two, they're both two. They will combine in a one-to-one -one ratio. And that will that will give you electrical neutrality. Plus two and minus two essentially cancel each other. So this is magnesium oxide. Okay, that's pretty simple. But sometimes the charges are not equal. So for example, if I were to take a magnesium ion 
and combine that with a chloride ion. Here, they're not equal, right? You have plus two in one of them, but you only have minus one in the other. So here's what happens. They combine in ratios that give you the electrical neutrality. The driving force is electrical neutrality. So if one of them has a charge of plus two and the, only one, the other one's only minus one, it requires two of the minus ones to combine with the one that's plus two. So you get two of the chlorides and one of the magnesiums. The way you write that is you write the metal first, the cation generally is shown first, and then you write the number here as a subscript. That two comes down over there. So this would be called magnesium chloride. And that's the compound, right? So the reason that the two is there is because each chlorine is only minus one, right? So if, if the magnesium is plus two and the chloride is minus one, you need two of the chlorides to balance that electrical charge. So it's gonna take two of them. The formula we write with subscripts, okay? Notice it is a balanced chemical equation, right? There's one magnesium on both sides and there's two chlorines on both sides. This would be called magnesium chloride. Another example, if we were to take, I'm gonna show you a different metal. This is from the transition metals. You can do it with those two. So suppose we had a zinc ion. Zinc is plus two. And we were gonna combine that with, let's do nitride, right? This is from column 5A, so it's minus three. This is a little tricky now because it's not so simple how to get those charges to balance out. So generally, if you get two and three, um, you're not gonna see very many ions where they're minus four or plus four. It can happen, but most of them are plus one, plus two, plus three, or minus one, minus two, minus three. If you get two and three, you can use this little crisscross method. The crisscross method is good for two and three. So if one of them is two and the other one's three, it doesn't matter which one's two and which one's three. If it, could, it could be plus three and minus two, that worked too. What you do is you write the formula just with the symbols. So you don't put the numbers in yet. And then you do the crisscross. So the three comes down here as a subscript and the two comes down here as a subscript. So you get three, two. Right, so you're reversing those numbers. Now, why does that work? Now that's not balanced, right? But what you do is you say, look, we got three zincs. So you put a three here and you got two nitrogens. So you put a two there and now it's balanced. The reason that works is because the lowest common denominator or I'm sorry, the lowest common product of two and three is six. Two times three is six. So what happens is if you have three of these, three times plus two, is plus six. And then two times minus three is minus six. So they, they works out, right? You got the same positive and the same negative if you combine it in that way. So that tends to work that crisscross method if you've got a you know plus three and minus two, or if you have a plus two and minus three. then you can use that. You generally don't need it for plus one and minus three because you just say, oh, it's minus three. So we need three of the plus ones, like, you know, like we did with the magnesium and the chloride, okay? So that's formation of compounds. Now here's what's interesting about these. They can go the reverse direction. When I say reverse, I mean that direction in water. It's a fascinating property of water. So this gets us into our sort of first homework assignment. If you try to dissolve ionic compounds into water, you've all seen this happen. You've seen it with table salt, right? Salt dissolves very well in water. We can dissolve salt into water. Here's what happens. Sodium chloride, so I'm starting with the compound, right? And I'm gonna write the state of matter. Table salt is a solid, right? Little salt granules. If we put it into water, so the way this is generally written is you put the water either above or below the arrow. 
Okay. That means we're dissolving the salt into water. That's what the meaning of that is. What happens is the salt breaks up into separate ions. It's the reverse of what we just looked at, right? Like if you take the ions and you combine them to form a compound, the water does the opposite. It separates the ions. And we indicate that it's in water by writing AQ. So dissolved into water is right here, the AQ. And that has a different meaning from liquid or solid or gas. It means that this substance, sodium chloride, is distributed evenly throughout the water. And that distribution is called a solution. A solution is where you have, for example, this salt distributed evenly throughout the water. The water is a liquid, but the sodium chloride in the, in the water is called a solution, a mixture, it's a type of mixture, and that is called aqueous, dissolved in water is aqueous. Now, the substance that you're dissolving into the other substance, for example, the salt is being dissolved into the water, so the substance being dissolved that one is called the solute okay so sodium chloride would be the solute the substance being dissolved into the substance that the solute gets dissolved into is called the solvent and then the two together is called the mixture. And this is a very special kind of mixture we call the solution. Solution meaning that it's just evenly distributed, okay? All right, so there's some terminology. So water can do that. Now, why can water do that? How does water do that? It's fascinating. What water does is it uses its electrical dipole. Remember we talked about that a moment ago. It has this electric dipole positive and negative end, to pull the ions apart from one another, to rip them apart. The positively charged sodium ion, right, it's a cation, and the negatively charged chlorine, a chloride ion. By the way, the chloride ion is larger than the sodium ion. It's quite a bit larger. If you take a look at those two ions, they're attracted to each other electrically, right? Positive and negative attracts, called Coulombic attraction. It's hard to pull them apart. The, the amount of energy of that attraction is very, very strong. But what happens is the water molecules, when you put the table salt into the water, the water molecules will orient, they're liquid, right? So they can rotate on their axes and interact with these ions like little magnets and they orient themselves such that the positive ends are near the anion, the chloride ion in this case, and the negative end of these water, remember these are water molecules, right? See how it's more useful to kind of show it this way than to actually draw the actual formulas? It's hard to draw those. See how they're orienting themselves? They're a liquid, so they can rotate and do this. Just like magnets, right? The magnets will attract each other. They will flip over so that they can interact. Same thing happens here. These water molecules will move towards these electrically charged ions and then essentially attach themselves to it. But remember, they're in a mixture. They're in this big mixture of water, which is everything's moving around, flowing around. So over time, they essentially just pull these ions apart. And that's called hydration. They will pull the ions apart so that you'll have two separate ions. Let's do the chloride here, which are separated by a bunch of water molecules now. Okay, 
So you're gonna have a bunch of water molecules around each of these ions. And I'm simplifying it just for practical reasons. There's a bunch of these, right? So the negative and the positive, the negative and the positive. The, neg the negatives will be near the sodium and the positives will be away. And then the same thing, you have a bunch of these water molecules on the chloride ions. So positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. It's actually a pretty large number. If you actually look at the number of water molecules that are gonna be interacting with these ions, it's around 30 or so. You get like six that are right around it. And if I could draw the three dimensions, I would show you, but you get six of the waters around it. And then there's another layer around that, kind of like an onion. You get the ion and then you get a, you get a layer of water molecules. That's called a hydration layer. And then you get another layer out that outside of that. There's two and then a third layer. And, you, and because the layers are bigger geometrically, they get larger and larger as you get further away from the center. You have more water molecules in the second layer than you have in the first one. And eventually you get up to like around, I don't know, 30 water molecules surrounding them. And so in the end, these ions are actually pretty far away from each other because they're surrounded by water molecules and they don't really get, they bounce off of each other, kind of like a ball, like sponges. Um, so imagine if you were somehow able to open up a sponge and put like a little marble at the center of it, the marble would be the ion and then the sponge would be the water molecules. So you'd have these squishy water molecules surrounding that hard marble, which is the ion at the center. And then they're separated and moving through space. So that's called hydration. And those are called hydration layers. And these now, these ions, we give a new name to them because these ions in water can conduct electricity. These ions are now able to move around in the water so they can move electrical charge. Every time an ion moves from one point to another, that's charge moving. And we call that an electrical current. And so um, we give the names to these ions. These ions are called electrolytes, okay? So each of these ions is called an electrolyte. And that's the terminology that's used in biology to discuss um, things like the calcium ion and the potassium ion and the magnesium ion and the chloride ion and the hydrogen ion as they go in and out of cells. Those are called electrolytes and they're called electrolytes. Light essentially just means a particle. So these are little particles that can carry electrical charge, right? And so they're called electrolytes. Okay, so what I wanna do now is give you a brief intro to the second type of ions. So we did monatomic ions, right? So we did sodium, that's a monatomic ion. Magnesium, that's a monatomic ion. Chloride, that's a monatomic ion. Oxide. Right, one atom ions, those are easy. But there's some more complicated ions that exist in nature and they're called polyatomic ions. And most of them are anions. So these are groups of atoms with charge. And there's a bunch of them you don't need to know all of them, but I wanna give you a few of them, okay? One I've already introduced. It was a cation, right? And it was ammonium. That's a polyatomic ion. It has more than one atom. In a sense, it behaves just like a monatomic ion. It's a particle. So even though it has five atoms, it essentially behaves like a big group of atoms that has a positive charge. So
So in a way, it's like a monatomic ion, but it's not because it has more than one atom, but it behaves very similar. In fact, the ammonium ion behaves a lot like a lithium or a potassium or sodium ion. They behave very similar. They have similar properties. We'll see that later in the chapter. So that, for the most part, is the only cation that you need to know, but there are also anions that are out there. So I'm going to give you a few of the common important anions. The first one is OH negative, and this is called hydroxide. And it has a charge of minus one. Okay, so that's called the hydroxide. Very important ion. You need it for biology, you need it for um, chemistry, you need it for all sorts of things, environment, stuff like that. Okay. And the next one is called the nitrate ion. And it's also minus one, NO3 minus two. The next one is called the carbonate ion. This one actually has a charge of two. The next one's called the phosphate ion. And it has a charge of minus three. So some of the polyatomic ions are minus one, some of them are minus two, some of them are minus three. Um, there's no real systematic way to kind of learn them. Um, they're just ones you just sort of memorize them. Let me show you a few more though. We got carbonate. Um, actually, let me just do this. I'm gonna actually look at the Alex and see if there's any that they give you. Nitrate, nitrate's a very important one. Um, sulfate, that's an important one. Sometimes people spell it with a pH. Okay, so that's with pH, that's just a different spelling of it. Um, Chloride, methanol. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Let's do any other ones. I think that's it for now. Like I said, there's a bunch of them. And if you can't, if you're doing some homework problem and you can't, um, you don't see it as one of these, you can just look it up. But it looks like that pretty much should be all the ones that you need to know, at least for now. When we get to section 4.2, we'll, we'll look at some others, okay? All right, so those are polyatomic ions. They behave just like monatomic ions and they follow the same rules, electrical neutrality, so forth and so on. So for example, if I take a hydroxide ion and I combine it with a monatomic ion of a sodium, it'll do the same thing. So the sodium will combine with a hydroxide in a one-to-one -one ratio, right? This is plus one. This is minus one, so they'll combine one to one. And so what you do for the formula is you just write the symbol of the metal because that's the cation. We write the cation first and then the anion. And then you write the formula for the anion, so NaOH, okay? If, there's, if the charges are not equal to each other, so for example, if I were to have, um, let's do carbonate with lithium. What you would do is you'd say, okay, the lithium is plus one and the carbonate is minus two. The charges have to add up together, right? Meaning that we have to have the same amount of positive as we have negative. So the way you do this is you say, look, if I made this a two, that would give me two times plus one, which is plus two, and that would balance our negative two. So if you have two of the lithiums, we write it as Li2, and then one carbonate, okay? There you go. So it follows the same properties, it's just that they are polyatomic. So now we've reached a point where now I think I can go ahead and um, give you an actual Alex problem. That's a lot of background. 
Let's take a look. So I'm going to look at predicting the products of dissolution. which is the first type of Alex problem for chapter four that it shows up here. So what they do here is they give you three materials. The first one's called isopropanol. The second one is nitrous oxide. And then the third one is propylene glycol. This is probably not the best one to give you at the beginning here. And then they give you the formulas. And then they what they want you to do is they want you to write out the major species present when dissolved in water. Okay. Now here's something that I haven't told you. There are compounds that are not ionic. They're called molecular compounds. Molecular compounds They don't form ions. They, they're not made of ions. Okay. And the problem with molecular compounds is that some of them do dissolve in water and others do not. So how do we know if it's going to dissolve in water? And there's no simple answer to that, but I'm going to give you a kind of a, a tip on in terms of how to do this. If the ending of the name, if it ends in OL, it's called an alcohol and it dissolves in water. Alcohols dissolve in water. The reason alcohols dissolve in water is because they have an OH group in them. So let me show you what I mean by that. See that OH there? That's very much like the OH you find in water. So what happens is alcohols also have a positive and negative end. They have a dipole. And so what happens is alcohols can interact with water molecules via that dipole. So the alcohol will form a dipole, plus minus, and the water molecules will interact with them. So this is water. Right. This is water. This is water. So what happens is that makes them soluble. They essentially dissolve in water, but they do not form ions. Okay. So they don't, anything that's an alcohol doesn't form an ion. So if you look at these three here, isopropanol, that's an alcohol, right? And so it will dissolve in water. So what you do when you write your answer is, it's not going to break up into ions. It's just going to stay intact as a compound. So you just write it as C3H8O. OK? So that dissolves into water. Let me see. Let me just make sure. OK, good. And actually, looking at the problem, it actually tells you that every compound is soluble in water. So that makes it easy. So what you do is you look and you see, OK, you've got this OH here. That means it's an alcohol. It's going to dissolve into water. So you can just write the formula there. It doesn't form ions. The second one, nitrous oxide, in this question, it tells you that it's soluble in water. So same thing, you look and you say, is this an ionic compound or a molecular? 
It doesn't have any metals in it, so it's not ionic. So it must be molecular. But it actually tells you in the problem, I didn't write it down, it tells you it's soluble. So you just write its formula down. Same thing with the third one, it has OL. So that means it's an alcohol, it's actually a glycol. A glycol is an alcohol that has more than one OH, has two OHs. And so that's soluble in water. You just write its formula. Okay. So that's the first one here. I wanna show you another one, one where they actually give you some ionic compounds. Okay, here's one. So again, predicting the products of dissolution, they give you this one, nitrous oxide. Again, they give you the formula. We already know the answer to that one because we just did it. Zinc bromide. And that's ZNBr2. And then copper sulfate. CuSO4. Okay. Um, it actually tells you in here that each compound is soluble in water. So here's what you do. So you want to write the species. And you can use commas to separate them. Again, you look at the formula, that's nitrogen, that's a non-metal. Oxygen's a non-metal. So that's a molecular compound. So if it's a molecular compound, you just write the formula down. That's what's gonna be dissolved into the water. The second one, however, has a metal, zinc is a metal. And bromide is a non-metal. So this is an ionic compound. So it's gonna break up into ions. So now we have to figure out what ions is it gonna break up into. So let me write that out here. You go back to your periodic table and look for any of the elements that we talked about. First column, second column, column five, column six, column seven, seven A. So the bromide is in bromide is in column 7A. And remember what we said about that? That means it's minus one. So here's what you have. You have two bromides, each one's minus one. Right? Each of those is minus one. There's two of them. So the, the negative part has to equal the positive part. So if you have two of the negative ones, that's negative two. So that means this one's gotta be plus two. So zinc has gotta be plus two. So then what you're gonna have is zinc plus two. And I'm just gonna use a comma to separate the second one. Bromide, which is minus one. Again, you don't put one, you just put negative in for it, okay? So those are the two species that are gonna be dissolved into the water, into the solution there. Let's do the same thing with the copper sulfate. you'll recognize that sulfate, that's one of those polyatomic ions I talked about. It's really sulfate minus two, right? Sulfate is minus two. So if this one's minus two, this one's gotta be plus two. So it's really copper plus two. So our answer there would be copper plus two, sulfate minus two with a comma separate. So those are the two ions that would be dissolved into the water. So molecular substances don't form ions, right? So that's why you just write the whole chemical formula for a molecular. The ionic ones do. And again, the ionic ones are the ones where you have a metal with a non-metal. One exception to that is the ammonium. If you have NH4, that one right there would be um, an ionic compound. Let's see if I can do one more. Okay, I don't want to do that one because none of them are ionic. I want to show you an ionic one. Okay, yeah, let's do one, this one right here. So same idea.
Okay, so the first one is sodium nitrate, and that's NaNO3. And then the ions are actually substances or species present. Second one is ammonium bromide. which is NH4Br. And third one's propylene glycol, which I think we already did that one. Okay. Okay, let's do the sodium nitrate. Sodium is in the first column, that's in 1A, so it's plus one. Nitrate, we recognize that as a polyatomic ion. That's one of those polyatomic ions I put in the list there a little bit earlier, right? It's NO3 minus, you gotta look those up. So NO3 minus. So you can kind of see why the formula for sodium nitrate is just NaNO3. It's not Na2NO3 or NaNO32. It's because one is plus one, the other one's minus one. If the charges are equal, they combine one to one. So that's an ionic compound. So they're gonna break up into two ions. Those are gonna be the two substances that are present in the water. The second one is ammonium bromide. So that one is NH4Br. So ammonium, that's one of the polyatomic ions, plus one. And then bromide group 7A, 7A is bromide. The halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. All of them are minus one. So that's minus one. All right. Again, if it's plus one, you just write plus. If it's minus one, you just write minus. So there's our two species there. And then the last one is propylene glycol. You look at that, there's no ammonium and there's no metal. So it must be a molecular compound. If it's a molecular compound, um, it doesn't break up into ions. Again, in this problem, they tell you that everything is soluble. They tell you everything does dissolve into water. Alcohols definitely dissolve into water. Glycols for even more so. So all we need to do there, that was, I'm sorry, that was C3. All we need to do there is write C3H6OH2. So it does dissolve in the water, but it doesn't break up into ions. So Alcohols, which have OH, sugars, or we call them saccharides. They also have OH, it's just they have a bunch of OHs attached to them. These all dissolve in water. Okay, so that's the first problem. That's from section 4.1 which is predicting the products of dissolution. What we'll do on Mon I'm sorry, on Tuesday, next Tuesday, is we'll get into precipitation reactions, which is section 4.2. So we'll start writing some net ionic equations. That'll probably take the whole hour to go through that. That's a pretty involved process. It involves a lot of what we did here today. So today was kind of building up our general understanding of ions and water and also the notation that we're using, right? Writing the formula with the charges and counting the charges and all of that. So we're gonna build on that on Tuesday and do precipitation reactions. Wednesday, I guess we'll do uh, acid-base reactions. And then Thursday, we'll get into reduction oxidation reactions. And, um, and then we'll go from there, okay? Um, the end of chapter four involves some calculations of molarity and, and that sort of stuff. So we'll get into that after we get through the redox reactions. So it should be interesting. We'll get into the real chemistry starting with precipitation and it builds up. So um, thank you for being here today. And um, this will be up online pretty soon. And have a great day. Reach out to me. Today's Thursday, Friday over the weekend. Reach out to me if you have any questions. And um, good luck with everything. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.